Hey guys, this is Andrew with Movie Clips of the LA Film Festival, and today I'm going to be reviewing Boxing Day. Now, this is the new Bernard Rose movie, and there actually should be a bit of uh, context required going into this. Uh, Bernard Rose, maybe 15 years ago, you might know him for uh, Candyman and Immortal Beloved. I personally love this guy. He's a great British filmmaker, great talent right now. And um, about 15 years ago, he made Anna Karenina, which wasn't very successful, wasn't very good. And subsequently, um, he's been adapting other Tolstoy uh, short stories into uh, modern day retellings with Danny Houston. Uh, this all started years back with Ivan's Ecstasy, followed by uh, Kreutzer Sonata, which I'm sure I'm doing terrible job with the pronunciation of that. I actually haven't seen either of those two films, which is interesting. So I'm going into this third part of a thematic trilogy of Tolstoy adaptations with Danny Houston, um, kind of blindly. Uh, I have read the short story that this one's based on. Boxing Day is based on Master and Man. And um, so I was kind of prepared for the direction that this was going to go into. Now, interestingly, the movie utilizes the modern day story for Tolstoy's adaptation um, to its benefit because they're utilizing the financial crisis that hit in 2008 with uh, a character, Basil, played by Danny Houston. He's a Los Angeles cat who's gonna go turn over a bunch of foreclosed homes in Denver for a profit. And immediately, this guy is is pretty slimy. He talks a church lady into kind of giving him a bunch of money for this uh, project and pretty much lies to her in, in his endeavor to do so. So he's the master. The man in the story is a guy named Nick, who's played by longtime Bernard Rose collaborator and screenwriter, uh, Matthew Jacobs, who is the English kind of driver for him in his venture to visit every piece of property in, in the snowy uh, mountains of Colorado. Now the movie starts off to be kind of a social comedy. Uh, Basil and Nick don't really particularly get off very well and it's very humorous at first the way they interact with each other and the way uh basil kind of just has this superiority complex over nick and the way nick just kind of sizes basil up without really getting to know him at all what's the name what's your name again mike nick sir yes just try and remember that all right thank you nick thank you slave excuse me doesn't know what did you say didn't say anything bernard rose captures their relationship really uh poignantly and quite beautifully uh they're kind of the odd couple in colorado um going from property to property and what's really interesting is how they adapt relatively simple characters in master and man Tolstoy actually kind of painted those original characters to be quite broad uh because at the end it was a moral morality tale uh whereas here Nick is a bit grating. He's pretty bad at his job. He's a pretty terrible chauffeur. He doesn't know the uh, navigation system, the GPS. Uh, Danny Houston's character has to com continually fix it for him and kind of lead him around. Yet at the same time, of course, Danny Houston, while being one of the most charming men alive, I have a huge man crush on this dude. I swear to God, Danny Houston is just an awesome guy. While being that dude, he he's still coming off as an entitled and, and prick. So you get a really interesting dichotomy that frankly is not there in the text itself. And Bernard Rose captures it really beautifully and makes you care about the characters, whether you know, particularly like them scene to scene or not. Which is interesting because it does eventually shift from a social comedy into a survival thriller as they navigate their way through the more remote areas and the more remote properties in Colorado. Uh, they start to get lost. The GPS starts to not work all that well. And they test each other's limits a bit. And then something happens. I'm not going to say what happens, but it really turns the tide for the tone of the movie. For a lot of filmmakers, the tone shift that happens in the second act would have been a, quite a difficult thing without turning a large majority of the audience off. But Bernard Rose does the brilliant thing of never seeming to shift genres, never sh seeming to shift out of focus of what you thought the movie was set up being, it all is telling the same story. And by the time it gets to the morality lesson that's in the text itself, it never feels forced. It kind of feels gradual and it's almost expected to be a very melancholic and beautiful and poignant ending. All around the performances, the way Bernard Rose captured it in almost a documentary-like sense. I can't imagine this film cost m much money at all. It's shot with DV. Uh, you know, he was one of the first filmmakers, he and Danny Houston, his collaborator here, to do um, uh, digitalized, you know, theatrical film with uh, Ivan's Ecstasy. And here he's really showing his craft for how to embrace digital filmmaking in a way that isn't just trying to replicate, you know, 
traditional 35 millimeter uh, cinematic uh, photography. He's really utilizing it to the benefit of making it look like a documentary film and making it look like this is really happening. I, I found myself incredibly engaged with this film. I loved it a lot. All that being said, let's go over to the movie clip scorecard to see what the tally is. Now I'm giving this one a 76 out of 100. All things considered, that's actually a really high praise coming from me. I'm a bit tight on this kind of stuff. Uh, so far, it's my favorite film I've seen at the LA Film Festival. And it's one of those movies that just really haunts you. It's been sitting with me since I first saw it at the beginning of last week at the LA Film Festival. And I can't recommend this one highly enough. I'm Andrew, and with movie clips at the LA Film Festival, we'll see you next time.